Sarah for introducing me and to the organizers of AMCA for organizing this wonderful conference. It's really nice that now there's a field for this. Um, okay, so uh, how do we move this forward? Here, there, yeah. Okay. In 1933, a small group of young artists held an exhibition at the Mimosa Hat Store on the first floor of Narman Lahan Beolo in Istanbul. Enigmatically calling themselves the D Group, they exhibited small drawings and paintings. It was the first exhibition in Turkey open to the public free of charge. <clears throat> Although the modernist graphic design of their work seems in line with Turkey's celebratory westernizing, the art establishment took it as an affront. Joining this establishment a decade after um, their first decade of exhibitions, the group continued to work together until 1951, becoming one of the most long-lived and well-known artists' collectives in the history of Turkish modern art. Although Turkish art history has generally recognized the importance of the group in terms of the stylistic modernization of art in Turkey, it has also tended to view it as an example of belated modernization which functioned as a natural rebellion of young artists towards an earlier generation. Emerging in the 1950s, this historiography has depended largely on two accounts of the history of modern art. It accepts the formalist narrative of Cubism established in The Way to Cubism of 1920 by da Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, who was the gallerist for Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso, used a formal historiography to emphasize their roles as gen genius innovators. The Turkish narrative also accepts the linear historiography of artistic modernism established through the work of Alfred Barr at the Museum of Modern Art in New York as a direct model for progress in Turkey. Barr's formalist stylistic historiography thus merged with the post-enlightenment model of linear modernism in which peripheries repeat the experience of centers in order to achieve progress. The resulting historiography of this key period in Turkish modern art has erased the political agency that initially made the work of the D group both avant-garde and controversial. This has transformed an era in which art functioned as a mode of political debate into a larger part of a linear nationalist narrative of undiluted and unquestioning support for the revolutionary politics of Turkey's first <coughs> decades. The relationship between the discussions of styles surrounding the early exhibitions of the D group, the education of the artists involved, the philosophy behind the French cubism that influenced them, and attempts to incorporate elements of local culture suppressed through contemporary modernist ideologies, reveals a subtle but pervasive critique of the top-down nationalism reflected in the art establishment coupled with an alternative vision for the future of the Turkish nation. The D group thus emerges as an avant-garde movement that addressed lo <coughs> local political discourse through stylistic appropriation, rather than aiming to contribute to an intrinsic progress of modernist art through stylistic originality. In 1933, Turkish art was dominated by two groups of artists. The established professors at the Istanbul Academy of Fine Arts, and new generations of younger students returning from postgraduate study abroad. Often referred to as the 1914 generation, the academic teachers favored realist, pseudo-impressionist styles adopted during their education in Paris between approximately 1908 and 1914. Their work dominated the organization of the Union of Fine Arts, geared towards facilitating exhibition and popularizing art, the annual Galatasaray exhibitions, which moved to the capital city of Ankara in 1926 and continued until 1951, and the annual state painting and sculpture exhibits established in 1939. Although in the 1920s, young artists eagerly adopted modernist styles quite different from that of their academic mentors, their stylistic choices nor their establishment of new or artists' organizations um, weren't very controversial. Documenting the first 10 years of art in the Republic, the artist and me later member of the D group, Elif Naji, quotes the director of the academy, Namık Ismail, 
as criticizing the new styles as merely a passing phrase. Even concerned with being new and original, calm has started to descend on the artist of this wild parade of the insane and the fashionable. Even the leader of this movement, Picasso, having passed the Cubist and Dada styles, is now producing academic works older than the classics. <clears throat> Nonetheless, state patronage of these young artists indicates support of new styles. The Ministry of Education purchased many of the works exhibited by the New Arts Organization in 1924. In 1928, the new Ankara Ethnography Museum hosted the first exhibition of the not yet named Union of Independent Painters and Sculptors, established by young artists returning from postgraduate study abroad and aiming to enhance the logistics of exhibition and popularize modernist movements in Turkey. Most of the artists associated with these movements had studied primarily in Germany. Although some adopted realist styles, others used expressionism to reflect the dynamic modernism of the young Republic of Turkey through both nationalist and contemporary scenes. If modernist styles had thus emerged in Turkey well before the D group assembled, then why was its anachronistic appeal to Cubism perceived as an affront to the arts establishment? Although the D group employed numerous styles, their association with Cubism reveals something. Although visually more conservative than the expressionist styles adopted by many of the independents, their use of Cubism was imbued with political meanings established both textually and through the educations of the D-group artists. These politics become apparent in the link between, a politics and, uh, between politics and Cubism, established in Ismail Hakka, later to add the last name, Balta Joulos, 1931 book, Democracy and Art. This ex book expressed an explicit link between modern art and societal culture for the first time in Turkey. Although his discussion features various modernist aesthetic styles, it culminates with reference to Cubism described through Bergsonian philosophical underpinnings that linked it with his oppositional political stance. Although the D-group artists used numerous styles, their work was dominated by a Cubism informed by their education in Paris under Entre l'autre and Fernand Léger, both of whom had been part of the Bergson-inspired group of Cubists who had exhibited together in Couteau. The text of the conservative cultural critic Peyami Safa, as part of the brochure of the D-group, his first exhibit, underscored their affiliation with a political conservative opposition. Thus, rather than simply reflecting European stylistics like the independents, their seemingly outmoded use of Cubism became a sign for political opposition to the hegemonic regime of the Republican People's Party. <coughs> Mark Antuff explains how Bergsonian thought provided an anti-rationalist model through which to establish an anti-historicist, anti-conformist vision of collective identity. The idea of moving around an object to seize it from several successive appearances, which enables the artist to be constituted in time, expressed in the 1912 uh, treatise on Cubism by the Puteau group artists Albert Gleis and Jean Metzinger, closely corresponds with Bergson's <coughs> concept of duration, a mode of psychological temporal continuity in which the past remains tied to the present in opposition to the intellectual time of science and positivism. In contrast to Kahnweiler's description of Cubism as a fragmentation of space that takes place within the canvas and thus operates within a progressive discourse <coughs> of artistic development, this interpretation emphasizes a transformation of the perceptual system of the viewer who breaks with the paradigms of positivism and gains access to suppressed intuitive modes of perception. <clears throat> Bergson's anti-rationalist philosophy became a means of fostering an alternative mode of nationalism to the royalist and thereby Latinist and classical nationalism promoted by the Action Française in the years before World War I. Bergson proposed that Cartesian reason, rooted in the Renaissance, represented an invasion of the true intuitive Celtic national spirit, Elan Vital, of France, which later was also transferred to Germany. Discarding the chains of Cartesian reason, 
His philosophy was to give free reign to the intuitive power of the French people. Instead of identifying classism, classicism with Cartesian reason, he recast French classicism within its revolutionary legacy. This was expressed by the Bergsonian poet Henri Martin Barzun, who proposed that each epoch or generation possesses its own personality, saying that artistic production reflects the novelty of an era and that, as a result, each era, era is classic. Art becomes classic in relation to itself, to its origin, to its ascending curve up to the point of consecration. So classicism became a future possibility, the collective legacy of an era's creative novelty, which in this case is identified with the French um, nation. So this became worked through the Puto group and uh, was adopted by the artists who were influenced by this thought, as well as by <laughs> Ismail Hakka. So as in early 20th century France, in the late Ottoman Empire and early Turkish Republic, Bergsonian philosophy provided a powerful theory of resistance to the positivist forces dominating political and cultural resistance movements, most prominently the anti-royalist Committee for Union and Progress, <coughs> which would ultimately formulate policies in the Republic of Turkey, founded in 1923. Although also part of the U Committee for Union and Progress, conservative intellectuals like Ismail Hakka who first encountered Bergsonian thought during his visit to Paris in 1905-1906, began to form a Bergsonian circle within the party in opposition to elitist social theory. During the armistice years between 1918 and 1920, these Bergsonian intellectuals placed new issues such as irrationalism, anti-intellectualism, intuitionist philosophy, and mysticism on the agenda of Ottoman intellectual life. As Kemalist reforms gained speed at the end of the 1920s and early 1930s, the same intellectuals deployed Bergsonianism as part of a movement towards Republican conservatism that critiqued the top-down elitism of the reforms and promoted instead an emergence of a Turkish élan vital through creative processes that would recognize the national durée. Hoping to drive Kemalism on a national than a rather than a universalist path of development, they defined a conservatism that put political faith in folk spirit, traditions, and mystical aspects of folk Islam as the basis for a modern ethical structure that could compete with a regression into the Islamic moral and ethical codes that dominated the other conservative opposition to regime, the regime, Islamic conservatism, which in contrast to the Bergsonian conservatism was completely against secularism. So this was a much more moderate type of internal um, opposition. So the first time I read Democracy and Art, I really thought Ismail Hakka was entirely crazy because these quotations are very, very um, bizarre. Instead, I later learned that really what he was doing was applying Bergsonian models and trying to describe a new vision for what art should do not as a reflection of democracy, but in order to produce a democratic modality of thought and feeling. Um, so it's really working on a very difficult register. And we can see this in this quotation. The new Turkey, which possesses a new culture, or better said, a new civilization, wants a new container of life, a new envelope of thought. The new Turk wants a new city, a new street, a new home, a new school, a new work, but does not yet know what the newness of this newness is. <laughs> and as you can see, um, the, there are a lot of images function very independently from the text. We have an image of a so-called black idol, which is simply con which is directly contrasted with these visions of skyscrapers. So these images become models, object lessons in the expression of national spirit through form. As the text proceeds, explaining how art makes itself classical through Bergsonian processes. Um, of expressing the needs of community and therefore spreading it and becoming a dominant expressive form, images on each page familiarize the reader um, with the modernist architecture of France. So basically we're learning about what the containers of um, modern life might be. As the images take the reader into the modern house through that symbol of modernity, the garage, the text explains how the new ideology and the new life 
must be declared and protected by the most fired up and believing people. It is here that the social role and the revolutionary duty of the individual, emer individual emerges. The combination of text confuses the interior realm, realm with the exterior, naturalizing the process through which aesthetic events become communal events, and the perceived self-orientation of the artist becomes part of the legacy of a people, defining its classical forms for the new era. Coming to examples of Turkish modern architecture, buildings so new that they spring from the not yet landscaped ground of the new capital in Ankara, he explains <coughs> that, interior, sorry, I seem to, oh. according to one author, artistic genres are like totems. It is in any case impossible to separate the idea of the artist from that of the people. In order for the work of art to exist, the viewer, reader, and listener must be a collectivity. The artist is a man whose soul is open to all the breaths of social life. In order to be an artist, it is necessary to discard our mortal selves, egos, and enter our communal selves. The role of the artist is to descend these social layers, to make these layers move. The artist speaks the imminent mystic conditions that exist within a people, but which are either asleep or are not conscious enough to express themselves, and thereby gives his people a language that is a consciousness. In this manner, souls which have unwittingly been separated and segregated come together. For this reason, the role of the artist is in one sense a moral role, because it serves for social unity. This is why artists have been roughly compared to a convex mirror. I just want to pause here. A lot of these terms are, of course, mystical terms. And so artists have been compared to a convex mirror. It's not really clear where this comparison has happened, but it's a very common um, Sufi metaphor. As part of its technical nature, this active mirror takes the scattered rays of light and gathering them within its space of movement reflects them as warmer and brighter. In the artist, of the folk finds itself. For this reason, the greatest sign showing the soul of the artist is love. Which, of course, also a great theme of poetry. Oh, not good. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to try to go fast. The duty of the artist does not consist of a historical rapture or expression relating to the past. Art has an entirely living duty. This is my favorite part. And that is to put the man of society to sleep, to keep the man of society busy in the realm of dreams, and in this manner to obtain a quite usable, rested group of nerves, a fresh communal conscience. Because in this manner, the social man will have resolved his hopelessness and harmlessly announced his rebellions. No need remains for him to be harmful and sterile in his real life. He will awake to life more well and better prepared. For this reason, the man of the era must be shown his own dream. The role of the artist is to be the conduit of the social dream. So, you put people to sleep and they wake up. So, what I noticed was not only this use of term terminology, but Baltajolu's last name, son of the axe man, is a kind of weird last name. And of course, an axe is very much associated with um, Bektashis, who were a, that was, which was the a uh, Sufi order with which Janissaries were associated. And so I haven't been able to trace what this relationship is because when the dervish orders were outlawed in Turkey, Bektashis were actually outlawed in 1826, but they continued in other forms. Many people continued to be members of tarikats, of dervish orders, but this was never written about. So it's very difficult to trace. Um, but that's a very possible connection. Um, I'm trying to, ooh, okay. Um, I'm just going to skip that part because I want to get to the actual D group. Um, so the members of the D group had studied with um, um, Andelot and Fernand Léger in Paris. And they started out by proposing this D as the fourth letter of the alphabet because they were the fourth uh, Turkish arts group. Um, but actually the fourth letter of the Turkish alphabet is a CH. And so it's very clear that they were trying to be a little bit like Dada. There was a Dada idea in mind. Um, their opposition is perhaps most clearly expressed by the writing of another conservative author whose name is Peyami Safa. Um, and this is a text that accompanied their, the brochure of their first exhibit. I'm not going to read it right now because I'm running out of time. But 
it emphasizes the idea that everybody should be able to look freely, and it emphasizes the idea of six arrows. Six would be a very important number because the Republican People's Party had the symbol of six arrows, which were their policies. And so this is offering a very subtle critique, which says, in the end, that the sensibility of being the sa seeing the same thing occurs in the mirror, in the photograph, and in the ox, which is clearly making fun <coughs> of something. Um, okay. So Cubism played a central role in the work of the D group, but it certainly wasn't a dominant style. Rather, it became a flexible category within the D group, where the earlier generations had been thought of as impressionists. These artists were more broadly um, Cubist. And this Cubism wasn't really just a stylistic issue, but I think it was really a reference to this other idea of Cubism, which was a somewhat more political image. So um, I'm just going to show you couple of, excuse me, um, some of the paintings, and you can see different variations of cubism and cubist issues in them. I'm not going into detail, just so you can see them. And so, there's a couple more things to say, which is that we can, the term avant-garde, it's important to remember what the term avant-garde meant. It was first applied to the social role of artists by Olinda Rodriguez, who was a follower of the utopian socialist Saint-Simon, in 1825. He proposed that, quote, the power of the arts is in fact most immediate and most rapid when we wish to spread new ideas. Ooh, what happened? <coughs> that wasn't what I wanted to do. Come back. No, we're almost at the end. There we go. It's kind of small, too. Oh, well. Oh, you can um, just click on it. Hmm? Click. I don't know what to click. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, the power of the arts is, in fact, most immediate and most rapid. When we wish to spread new ideas among men, we inscribe them on marble or on canvas. What a magnificent destiny for the arts is that of exercising a positive power over society, a truly priestly function. You just oh, yourself time. oh, sorry. I only need like two more minutes. Okay. So if we think of the avant-garde in this sense, then what we have is that an artists who use art as a model for independent thought through which to lead society. So the function of an avant-garde was social rather than aesthetic. The deployment of Cubism by the D group in Turkey in the 1930s was avant-garde in this sense. It was not simply an art movement, but indicative of political opposition to a top-down and singular vision of modernity. It is thus, perhaps, no surprise that the group disbanded in 1951, the year that the relatively populist Democratic Party unseated the Republican People's Party in the first free elections since the foundation of the Republic.